Thanks be to God. And what a beautiful and just the perfect song to introduce us to our scripture for the sermon. This is our third week in the book of Colossians. We will have two more weeks after this in this service. We'll spend all of July in Colossians. And I invite you now to read along as we hear the word of God as it is proclaimed in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, continue to walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Watch out that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by the removal of the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him, when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. Amen. A long time ago, in a land known as Mrs. Davis's third grade classroom, we learned how to write in paragraphs. Now, for little people who had only recently learned how to double knot their shoelaces, this felt like a really daunting task. How many sentences do we have to write was the popular question of the hour. Miss Davis calmly explained five sentences. A five sentence paragraph has five sentences. One for your main idea, three supporting sentences, and one concluding sentence. I have a distinct memory of staring out the window at the blue Georgia sky and suddenly I was inspired to write my paragraph about a catcher's mitt. Clearly God was at work. Using the fact that I was a huge Atlanta Braves fan and that I sort of had a crush on Bruce Benedict who was the catcher in the 1980s for the team. Now, years later, I would look out at that same blue Georgia sky in search of inspiration for a thesis statement for my first big college paper, which was not about a catcher's mitt. But the concept was the same. You start with your main idea, what you really want to say, and then you spend the rest of the time backing it up. At the beginning of our passage that we just read, Paul takes this main idea approach as he starts what is the heart of the letter to the Colossians. Now, all of Paul's letters have a really big main idea. Paul, though, often backs these main ideas up with these very complex arguments that fit together like a 3D puzzle. So as a preacher, I'm always grateful when there's a section where there's a main idea and several supporting sentences, which is what we have today. But most importantly, what I appreciate about this passage is Paul is being so careful and so clear here because he is intent on shoring up the foundations of the church at Colossae, or more accurately, reminding them where their foundation truly lies. 
Last week in Eric's sermon, towards the end of chapter one, we hear Paul paint this huge, big picture, cosmic view of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. A quick refresher. He writes, he is the image of the invisible God. All things have been created through him and for him and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things. Now that, brothers and sisters, is a main idea. Big picture stuff and it's beautiful. And right after that, Paul encourages the Colossians that they have been reconciled to God in Christ, who is now in them, the power of Christ in us, as Chris just sang, and in whom they have all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Which brings us to this section where Paul is applying that big picture cosmic view of the wonder of who Jesus is to the particular challenges that we're facing the church at Colossae, which are very similar to many of the challenges we face today as well. Here's his main idea in verses six and seven. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. That big picture truth of Jesus, the one in whom all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell, and through whom God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, all of creation, Sisters and brothers, Paul is writing to them, this is already yours. You already belong to this huge cosmic story of redemption. The very moment that you sensed God's grace and the very moment that you accepted him as your Lord, you were already reconciled to God, fully embraced by God in Christ Jesus. This is the same truth that Epaphras taught them, Paul's colleague who helped establish the church at Colossae. And when he brought this good news to them, he was cutting through the muck and the mire of all of these competing philosophies that were popular at the time in Colossae. And so Paul is reinforcing what they already know. He wants again to shore up their foundation in the face of confusion that is trying to rock that foundation. He wants them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt they are already rooted in the rich, life-giving soil that is Christ Jesus. They already have a strong and sure foundation in him. They have already received Christ Jesus the Lord as verse 6 declares. In his book on Colossians, pastor and author Eric Porterfield notes that received is a grace word, reminding us that we don't achieve anything in our life of faith, but we receive all things as a gift from God. And Eric goes on to explain that the faith of the Colossians that Paul keeps encouraging them about and praising them about, it's not about how spiritual they are. Their faith is about how receptive they are, how they have been able to receive what God has been doing in Jesus Christ. They were receptive to that. And when they received it, what they discovered is that was just the beginning. That initial experience of grace was just the start because grace is transformational and it continues on and on and on and it transforms us in body, mind, and spirit. Thanks be to God that they were so receptive. And at the same time, the Colossians like us are also in the now and the not yet 
reality of God's transformational work. Paul talks about this a lot. The reconciliation of us to God through Christ Jesus has already begun. It was begun in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and yet it's not complete yet, is it? Just look in the mirror. Just look around. It's not complete, and it won't be until Jesus returns. And so that's where we live. That's where the Colossians were living in what I like to call the messy middle. Redemption has started, and it's powerful and real, and it's not yet complete. The opposition group in Colossae, that's what we're going to call them, the people who are changing things up, trying to change the gospel, trying to add to it, this opposition group isn't quite buying into this now and not yet. They're not sure much is going on in the now. It's sort of like they're just always living in the not yet. And so they have decided that they're going to help Jesus out. They have just the way to move forward towards whatever is coming. This opposition group holds that Jesus' reconciling work between us and God in his life, death, and resurrection, it's not quite enough. In order to be truly reconciled to God, they say, we also need to think our way into salvation in line with the spiritual philosophies that were popular in Colossae during that day. And there's more. We also need to practice severe self-discipline on our bodies so that we can become more spiritual. The way this opposition group sees it, we're about to find out what the way is, the way that the opposition group sees it is that the Colossian Christians have a lot of work to do, and they better get to it if they want to be closer to God. But thank goodness this group knows just the way. Now, this group isn't creating anything new. This is their own version of a mashup of different popular strains of thinking that were just in the water you drink and the air you breathe in Colossae at that time. Remember, it's a polytheistic Gentile city, and they have all sorts of ideas about how to get closer to God, about how to be spiritual. And it's likely that most of the Christians in this church, most of the new Christians, they've lived in Colossae. This has been their story. And many of them probably bought into some of these philosophies and approaches and had even practiced them before they met Jesus through Epaphras. Everyone around them thought like this. It was the norm. And aren't the grooves of familiar ways of thinking the habits of a lifetime so hard to break? I wonder if part of what's happening here within this opposition group who thinks they need to add on to all these things into the gospel, I wonder if what's going on with them in part is that they simply cannot quite trust that God loves them this much. That Jesus Christ, who is the one who truly holds all things together, is also the Jesus Christ who gave his life for them and who cares deeply about each of them. I mean, all of us know that there's no such thing as a free Let's try that again. There's no such thing as a free lunch. That's right. And I'm betting that ancient Colossae had their own version of that same little saying. It's hard for us as humans to be that receptive to God's gift. We kind of like doing things ourselves, don't we? We like being in charge. So maybe to circle back to Eric's statement from earlier, this particular group in Colossae that's opposing all of this, maybe they just have a low level of receptivity. They're having trouble receiving the fullness of God's grace and to trust that redemption is at work right here, right now, 
And even though it's not complete, Jesus really doesn't need them to try to go around and fix things for him. Trusting that we already belong to God, that we're already reconciled, has been a challenge for believers for centuries. It's really nothing new. In the everyday living out of our faith, amidst the distractions and losses and temptations of our world, a world that's always trying to sell us some scheme of how things can get better, we often fall back on our own favorite familiar ways of thinking and fixing things. It's always tempting for us to focus so much on our own projects and so much on the way we think things ought to be that we get on our own self-improvement plans trying to make ourselves better or, as we humans are so good at doing, we look around us and see other people who need to be improved and we're right there ready to help them. And when we're in that mode, it's like we've forgotten that we've already received Jesus Christ as our Lord. And in his grace, he is the best one to manage the redemption of our world and of each of us. As some of you know, I am a very big fan of home renovation TV shows. Raise your hand if you like to watch the home renovation shows. Thank you. Loud and proud. I, I appreciate that. Just right up there, Amber. Me too. I love it. There's something so satisfying about watching some cramped, ugly, outdated space get a complete transformation into a beautiful, welcoming space, and all of it happens in the course of one hour. I love that part. It's like it's some modern version of a children's magic show, right? Wave the magic wand, bibbity boppity boo and there it's all better. But behind that, what is hidden are all these workers behind the scenes who are actually doing the work and the timelines that the producers sort of ignore or gloss over and, of course, the huge budget that it takes to make all of that happen. What's fascinating to me is my own willingness to participate in this magic show. I suspend my disbelief every time. I mean, I've lived through renovations before. I know what they're like. And talk about the messy middle. If you've ever been through a renovation, haven't you stopped to think somewhere in the middle, what have we done? What have we started? Will this ever be complete? In reality, that new bathroom or new porch or new room that we see on TV, behind that is a lot of intense planning and blood, sweat, and tears, and usually, again, that big old mess before everything is put back together in new life. And so it is with us. Only we're not the ones renovating ourselves or this world. That is God's work. It is God's redeeming work. And God has already started that work in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, reconciling all the world to himself. It's not complete yet. Again, all we have to do is look in the mirror to be reminded of that or to look around us at our broken and hurting world. But it is here, and it is now, that redemption, that grace, that good news. And we see it, too, don't we? Glimpses of the kingdom every day if we're looking. So yes, it's now, and yes, it's not yet, but it is here. We've already received Christ Jesus as Lord, as Paul reminds we're already deeply rooted in his love, and we already have him as our strong foundation. But still, this opposition group in Colossae and so many other groups in the years since, and even now, are happy to add on all sorts of extra requirements so that we can be closer to God. 
or that's what they tell us. And it's usually a pretty good hard sell for spiritual self-renovation. And goodness gracious, this group in Colossae, they're ready to hand you a toolkit and a how-to video, and maybe for $19.99, they'll even come and grab the hammer right out of your hand and do it for you, because they've got the answers. But Paul has something to say about this in verse 8. Don't buy the snake oil, basically. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy or empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ Jesus. Don't buy into what they're selling, Paul is telling them. He's already reminded them, you already have what you need. Because the approach that this opposition group is selling and that the approach is all around us as well, can never bless us because they're not based on Jesus. They're based on human traditions and human-sized ideas or worse, as Eric describes in his book, spiritual powers that were created by God for good but now work against the purposes of God. They cannot be trusted. Then Paul goes on in the next verses to counter the primary ingredients in this snake oil. He starts with this. No believer needs to severely discipline or worse harm their bodies in attempt to be more spiritual, which is one of the things this group in Colossae is saying. You need to really restrict your body. You need to severely discipline yourself. Paul explains in verse 9, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily in Christ, and you have come to fullness in him, the head of every ruler and authority. In other words, if God thought it was a good enough idea to send Jesus in bodily form, then God is not anti our bodies. Regardless, he created our bodies, so don't buy that. Don't listen to that. And besides, Jesus is the boss of every ruler and authority on earth, every elemental spirit, every human who thinks we know best. So don't believe anyone or anything that asks you to do something that goes against Jesus. Don't believe anything that makes you hate yourself, hate others. Don't do it. Verses 11 through 14 confirm, again, that our bodies are are accepted. Now, we remember these are Gentile Christians, not Jews. So they would not have been circumcised, which was the sign for the Jewish people that they were people of the covenant, a bodily, physical sign that they were people of the covenant. And some are saying that these people, Gentiles, need to be circumcised. But Paul has something to say about that, too. He says, you don't need to change your bodies through circumcision in a quest to become more or better spiritually. Because the cross is its own circumcision. It's its own physical identity statement of who Jesus is. He is known by his scars. That's his identity. And because we have been buried and raised with Christ in our baptism, because he is in us, we are part of that as well. We're included. God has made us alive in Christ Jesus and raised us from the dead. He has forgiven our trespasses, erasing any record, just like with the Etch-a-Sketch, of our human sin and failure, setting all that aside and nailing it to the cross, Paul tells us. As verse 15 wraps it up for us, God's love in Christ Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. All things that work against God have been unmasked when Jesus was crucified and raised. They've been unmasked as the empty, deceitful, damaging, allegiance-stealing snake oil that they are. Whatever those rulers or authorities or elemental spirits, whatever it is in our world 
that wants to hang over our heads all that we've done wrong to keep us captive and hustling to serve them instead of Jesus. Jesus has already reconciled and forgiven all that. And so it disempowers anything that wants to tell us we are not enough in Christ. It disempowers anything that wants to tell us we have to work to hustle or measure up or fix ourselves or anybody else. No, Paul says, don't buy it. You are already rooted in Christ. You are already building on his firm foundation. All that's left for you is to keep growing, guided by the Spirit, to become who you already are. Paul says this same truth in different words in Romans. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing. 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 Sisters and brothers, there is plenty in our world that tries to convince us we can be separated from that love. There's plenty in this world that is constantly reminding us that we're not enough, we're not good enough, there's something wrong with us, as if we didn't already know. But the reality is that no matter how much snake oil we humans can produce to try to get shortcuts and workarounds and use human ideas to try to confuse other people, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. It's already who we are. And the best way to sell us that snake oil is to try to convince us that we're not who we are. But Paul keeps saying, remember who you are. Remember, you have already received Christ your Lord. You are already deeply rooted in him and building on his foundation. And that's enough. Brothers and sisters, what was true for the Colossian Christians is true for us. We've already received Christ Jesus as Lord. We are already deeply rooted and building on his foundation. And even right this minute, the Spirit is at work as we worship, continuing to deepen those roots and build us up. Jesus is enough. As we live together in this messy middle, this now and not yet, of God's renovation project for all of creation for each of us as individuals, may God continue to deepen those roots In this truth, Jesus is enough. May God teach us to see the snake oil for what it is and to resist it. And may God assure us that we have been made alive in Christ Jesus so that we might grow and flourish and participate as God calls us to do in his redemption work. It's who we already are. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, our world is so full then and now of plenty of people trying to tell us who we are, trying to manipulate us, scare us, hurt us. Send us on this road of distraction when all we really need is you. Lord, we thank you for the many ways that you provide us help through one another, through the helping professions, through the writing and the work of Christians who've gone before who understand this truth, and how you use all of that to keep us rooted and built up. Oh, Lord, give us the power to discern in the days to come 
What is not blessing us because it doesn't truly reflect you? And keep us, Lord. Keep us deeply rooted in you so that we can grow more and more into the disciples you need us to be for such a time as this. In Christ's name, amen.